In this video, we will look at how to quantify a relationship between variables. Many studies measure variables on the same individuals, same subject or same samples to understand if there is a statistical relationship between the variables. As an example, a medical study may find that lung capacity decreases with the increased number of cigarettes smoked per day. In another study, a relationship between the amount of alcohol in blood and the number of beer bottles consumed can be examined. To statistically characterize such bivariate relationships, there are a number of things to be determined. First, you want to determine the strength of a relationship between the two variables. In other words, um, we want to quantify how consistently one variable changes as the other changes. Secondly, um, you want to determine the direction of the relationship between the two variables, whether the relationship is positive or negative. And finally, we'd like to know if the measured relationship is statistically significant from no relationship. The best way to visualize the bivariate relationship is to draw a scatter plot using a pair of scores as x and y coordinates. When you draw a scatter plot, the values from one variable go to horizontal axis, whereas those from the other variable appear on the vertical axis, comprising x and y coordinates. Whenever it is clear that one variable is an explanatory or predictor variable, then it typically goes to the x-axis um, when the outcome or response variable goes to the y-axis. So here are some example scatter plots to illustrate different relationships. So in examining a scatter plot, uh, you want to look at first for an overall pattern showing the form, direction, and strength of the relationship. For example, the top left panel, um, this one shows very strong positive correlation where the, uh, where the overall pattern moves up from lower left to the upper right. That is, um, as one variable increases, the other also increases, right? So we call this pattern a positive association between the two variables. The form of the relationship is linear because the overall pattern follows a straight line from lower left to the upper right. The strength of a relationship in a scatter plot is determined by how closely the points follow a clear form, in this case, a line. So the relationship in this figure is quite strong because the points are uh, very close to forming a straight line uh, going through the dots. So variables can be um, negatively related where the direction of change is opposite between the variables as shown in the bottom left and the middle panels. In case of negative relationship, the direction of a change is going opposite between the variables. So when a variable increases this way, um, then the other variable actually decreases, or vice versa. If one variable decreases this way, then the other variable actually increases. Um, the upper right panel, um, shows an example of no relationship where there is no obvious or consistent change in one variable regardless of whatever change in the other variable. Um, so if you see like circular pattern like this then it is most likely that there's no relationship or very very weak relationship if there is any. 
And finally, there can be other relationship than just a linear relationship as shown in this uh, bottom right corner, where there seems to be a curvilinear relationship instead of a straight line. So, well, maybe the, um, the right part of the um, pattern can be modeled with line, but you know, if we just connect all these dots, so if we just draw a line going through uh, these dots, then we can see that this is more like a, you know, curve instead of a straight line. Um, in this lesson, however, only a straight line relationship will be of concern. Now, let's take a look at an interesting study published in Science where the researchers used the correlation statistics to figure out the role of non-exercise activities such as fidgeting and the fat gain. Have you ever wondered why your friend seems to stay slim even though she or he stuffs his or her face with food all the time when you get bloated like a puffer fish instantly even from drinking a cup of water? Interestingly enough, some people don't gain weight even though they seem to eat a lot more than they deserve. So the researchers hypothesized that maybe fidgeting and other non-exercise activity related to the observation that some people may spontaneously increase the non-exercise activities when they eat more than their fair share. So the researchers provided excess amount of food to 16 healthy young adult volunteers for eight weeks. Compared to the baseline, they measured fat gain uh, in kilograms as an exploratory variable, and they also measured the change in energy expenditure of the volunteers as a response variable from the activities other than deliberate exercise, such as fidgeting, posture, uh, posture maintenance, and the like. So here are the data. Now the question was whether or not people with larger increases in non-exercise activities tend to gain less fat. So to see the pattern in the data, we will make a scatter plot using Jamovi. So here are the data I already typed up in Jamovi. So the first column represents the um, the non um, uh, the the energy expenditure the change um, from the uh, non exercise activities, and the second column is the um, change in the fat gain compared to uh, the baseline. So to um, see if there's any uh, relationship between these two variables, um, you want to draw a scatter plot. And you can actually use this uh, um, menu, regression menu, to calculate the correlation matrix. Uh, but it's better to use other module uh, for the purpose of drawing a scatter plot, which is called Scatter, and so you want to install this. Right, and this module can be found under Exploration. Now you can see that there is new menu um, uh, is created. So let's just click Scatter Plot. And then um, we want to see the regression line, uh, which should be linear, the straight line. Um, the marginals in, you know, this, this will show you the distribution of each variable, but um, the visualization is not so great. Um, so we're going to just, uh, you know, leave this um, as it is for a moment. Um, but you know you're you're welcome to experiment with these options to see you know um, 
uh, what they look like. Now, because the change in the non exercise activity, um, I mean, the energy expenditure change uh, from the non exercise activity is our explanatory variable, right? So you, you want to move that to x axis, uh, basically the horizontal axis, and fat gain is the response variable. So that goes to the y axis. Okay, so there we go. So um, as we um, asked, you know, we can see that the um, the energy expenditure change from the non-exercise activity uh, is on the x-axis, and the fat gain is on the y-axis. So um, just to suppress the regression line, and from this just a cloud of dots we can see that there's uh, some negative relationship going on here, right? So as uh, the individuals increase the um, energy expenditure um, from the non-exercise activity, um, their fat gain actually decreases, right? So if you're just um, engage in non, uh, more and more non-exercise activity, it seems like uh, you accumulate less uh, fat or less um, you know weight so that is our observation and if you just click this linear then it'll actually give you the best fitting line going through uh, the cloud of dots Now let's uh, quantitatively characterize the relationship. Perhaps the simplest way to look at how two variables are associated is to calculate how much they co-vary. So the covariance statistics is an index of how much two variables vary together and the equation of the covariance uh, basically amounts to the averaged sum of cross product deviations. If you think about how you calculated the variance from the exploratory data analysis, the variance is a special case of the covariance where the two variables are identical. So you notice that this equation um, is uh, basically the same as the variance equation except that um, you know, instead of squaring the differences, we multiply them um, by the corresponding difference, deviance or the residual, that's what they call. Um, so basically the variance is this. So call x, x instead of a y. So that becomes sum of an x over bar uh, x minus x bar over n minus 1 squared right so that is the variance basically but now we have two different variables um, so it has more general form of covariance statistics and um, now the cross product deviation calculates so that's what's on top before the summing sign so that uh, so that is the cross product deviation um, and that calculates the similarity between the patterns of differences of the two variables by multiplying instead of adding the deviances also known as residu uh, residuals if both variables uh, both residuals sorry have the same signs uh, meaning both are positives or negatives then that cross product will give us a positive value indicating the residuals being in the same direction however if one residual of one variable um, is positive and the other is negative or vice versa then the resulting product will be a negative indicating the residuals being uh, opposite in direction 
So now let's use Jamovi again to calculate the covariance in step-by-step -step fashion. Now we're back to Jamovi and let's just go back to data. And while we're doing this, um, uh, I hope you have that you know slide in front of you right uh, with the equation the covariance equation see if you look at the equation uh, we're going to calculate the uh, the cross product first before we sum them but if you look at um, the each bracket um, you need to calculate the deviance right so xi minus x bar is the deviance of the x variable which is the uh, non-exercise activity change and the yi minus y bar is the deviance of the fat gain from um, the mean of the fat gain right so to calculate the uh, deviance uh, statistics of each variable uh, first you need to know uh, their respective means right that the averages so we need to calculate the average first so descriptives so you move um so all you need to know is actually mean and the standard deviation for later uh, when we need to calculate the uh, correlation coefficient so uh, these are the only things that we want to know right so we have 16 data set 16 pairs right and the mean of the NEA change is uh, this and the mean of the fat gain is this value so now that we know uh, the means of each variable we can calculate the deviance of each variable right so we can uh, easily calculate this using the compute function so let's start with the NEA change first so let's say this is um, x minus x bar I don't know if it is allowed and what you want to do is to subtract all the values of that variable minus oops um by right, three to four point seven five now that is also it is allowed actually so that is the difference um between each value and the mean of this variable right so in the test deviance or the residual statistics um, representing the relative distance of each datum from the center of the variable okay so that is that and now we want to calculate the y deviance the y residual so you need another compute variable and that is y minus y bar oh now click that and now you have to move fat gain minus the mean of the fat gain which is 2.3875 if we do that right so then you know these are the relative distance of um, the fat gain values from the center or the mean of the fat gain now that we have uh, two residuals you have to multiply them the cross product and to do that you need again another compute variable and cross product is times so times is this star sign in Jamovi okay so that x product column is now created for us which is the cross product between 
these two columns, right? Um, so if you look at the signs, um, in fact, except for this one, except for this 94.991, every cross product value um, has negative signs. So um, it is very likely that the relationship between these two variables is negative by just looking at the sign of the cross product. Um, now you want to have sum because you have the uh, sigma in front and to do that you just go back to exploration and descriptives and now you need sum that's all you need okay so this is our sum the sum of the cross product and negative um, 3,427.1. So um, now that you have this um, numerator value, now you have to divide this by the number of pairs, 16 minus 1, which is 15. So if we just... So go back to the slide, and that's negative... over minus one so we need calculator so so it is that value now That's oh. two, two, eight. Okay, so that is two hundred twenty-eight point four seven three is the uh, the covariance statistics. Oh, I forgot the sign. So it's negative. Now, the problem with the uh, covariance statistics is the uh, scale dependency. Even though the statistics represent how strong the relationship is between the two variables, it is difficult to know how much relationship there actually is between the variables based on the value as it is unique only to this instance so we cannot interpret the uh, covariance statistics in an objective manner therefore we need to standardize the covariance so that we can have a consistent way to interpret the relationship between any two variables to do so, uh, what we need to do is to divide the covariance statistics by the standard deviation of each variable to make it independent of scale. And this was the reason why I included the uh, standard deviation calculation um, in Jamovi, so that we can use these values to standardize the covariance. Um, if you think about it, um, it is very similar to the Z transformation where you divide the difference by so the difference of a score from the mean and the difference that difference uh, divided by the uh, standard deviation to uh, standardize a score in the unit of standard deviation. And when we do that, uh, then we have a standardized covariance statistics called Pearson's product moment correlation coefficient, which is denoted by a letter R. So after we do this uh, standardization, 
the R, the correlation coefficient, so typically we call this correlation coefficient, ranges from negative 1 to positive 1, where the um, R equals negative 1 indicates a perfectly negative correlation, whereas R equals positive 1 represents a perfectly positive correlation. And R equals zero represents no correlation, right? So if we calculate the correlation coefficient to quantify the amount of relationship between any two variables, uh, the value only ranges between negative one to one. So you cannot have R greater than uh, plus minus one, uh, greater than plus one or less than minus one. You cannot have those values. So as long as the R um, is moving away from zero in either direction, and when it gets closer to R equals one, that means um, the relationship between the two variables is quite strong and if it is close to zero then the relationship is really weak now let's calculate the uh, r the pearson's r so we know our covariance statistics Let's And now we need to go back to Jamovi to find out the standard deviations. So for NEA change, it was um, 257.66 times. 1.1389 Now we need calculator to So it's about 0 0.78, 0 0.78. Oh, so it's negative again. So it's negative 0 0.78. So that is our um, Pearson's R. So, um, it is quite close to negative one, so we can say that the relationship is, um, uh, you know, substantially strong, but in negative way, right? So they have negative relationships. So if the NEA, um, the non-exercise activity increases, then the amount of fat gain decreases. So that's what it means. So now we know the direction and the strength of the relationship. So the next thing we need to find out is the statistical significance. So if this statistics is indeed statistically significant, so it's something other than zero relationship, that's what we need to find out. As I said, uh, once we calculate the R, then we need to find out if the relationship between the variables quantified by the correlation coefficient is statistically significant using NHST. So the null hypothesis in case of the correlation coefficient is that there is no relationship or the correlation coefficient R equals zero. 
On the other hand, the alternative hypothesis is that no, R is not statistically zero um, under the sampling distribution of R given the degrees of freedom, which is N minus, N minus two. And in this case, N um, represents the number of pairs. So in our previous data, we have 16 pairs, right? Um, so the degrees of freedom for our data is 16 minus two equals 14. And because the sampling distribution of Pearson's R does not follow the normal distribution, Fisher, Ronald Fisher, uh, made the, uh, the following transformation um, to make this sampling distribution set R's um, distribution um, follow normal distribution. And here, um, where did it go? Oops. Sorry. Um, right, so uh, LN represents natural log. So it's a log base E epsilon, and R is uh, the Pearson's R we just calculated, and uh, SEZR is the uh, standard error of this. Z are the transformed quantity, um, which can be calculated using this equation where the n big n represents the number of pairs of the data. Now let's find out the transformed sample statistics using the equations. All we have to do is to just uh, plug in the knowns in the equations. So um, we know that R was negative 0.78, so we just plug in that number in place of R's, and then, oh, um, if you calculate, you know, this term, um, so what over two, natural log, and inside the bracket, then uh, the ZR will become negative 1.05. And likewise, you um, calculate the standard error of the set R by just to plug it in uh, the 16, the number of pairs in the data set. And if you calculate that, then it's a 0.28. Now, this only follows normal distribution, so you want to actually standardize um, the sampling distribution of this by dividing this by the standard error of the set R. Um, so you just plug in those two numbers you obtained and then finally um, the standardized set score of that set R will be negative 3.75. Um, now because this set follows standard normal distribution, uh, we know that um, this statistics is significant. Right, because this is less than negative two standard error mean under the uh, sampling distribution of normal distribution. So this is a uh, observed statistics negative three point seven five, and under a normal sampling distribution, um, you know, with a plus minus two standard error mean. Um, we have 95% and the remaining tail um, represents the 5%, the alpha uh, level, at uh, the level of significance alpha 0.05, right? So that is the rejection region. So your statistics should be um, more extreme than these boundary values on the other side. So this is two-tailed way. When it is two-tailed, the alpha 0.05 is divided by two. So we only have 2.5 at each end. Now, if you look at the location of this um, observed statistics, that it is actually on the far left here, right? Somewhere here. I mean, 
it is not the exact location, but we know that it is actually less than negative uh, 1.96. So we know that this statistics is extreme enough. So we reject the null of no relationship this time, right? Even though we do not know the, um, the actual p-value of this, but we're going to just see how to calculate this using Jamovi. And the 95% confidence interval, and you can just use these equations to find out the lower boundary and the upper boundary of uh, the ZR actually. So if we calculate the lower boundary is negative 1.6 and the upper boundary is negative 0.5, so the 95% confidence interval for ZR, not R, becomes um, these right so this actually um, placed in between these two values and because those limits both limits have negative sign that means is um, statistically significant um, relationship this time so it is actually not including zero r equals zero z r equals zero so uh, if we know that this um, relationship is significant however because this is a 95 percent confidence interval for zr which was in uh, the natural log space right so we need to actually convert these back into the real space the real r space so that um, we can have um, the values in the right um, you know unit so same as the, the original unit. And so you basically have to rearrange uh, this equation for R, which is quite um, complicated uh, if you're not familiar with how to do this. Um, but I'll just explain how you rearrange this to find out the, um, the 95 correct 95% confidence interval in real space. So I'll just only um, take an example of the lower um, boundary uh, because the upper boundary will be the same. So basically from this equation, right, we move to this. Oh. And we need to multiply two on both sides so that we have two in front of the left term, right? And then we remove the constant here. And then from there, we need to have to remove the uh, natural log on the right side. To do that, you exponentiate both sides. So you have E and E, and because we have natural log has the same base, so this actually will uh, inverse the natural log up here. So as a consequence, we only left with this term, right? But this. Uh, at the right term, sorry, and then the left side is actually exponentiated, right? So that 2 times the ZR lower becomes the power of the E, right? And then from here, we want to move this denominator to this side by just multiplying the same uh, 1 minus R lower on both sides. And so that becomes this, right? So, and we only left with the numerator on the right side. And now we're going to just expand the bracket. And it will become this and this, this, the second term. 
and we didn't do anything on the right side. Now we're going to move this R to this side and move one to this side. Okay. And now we have uh, so the plus one neg becomes negative, and you know, the, it was a negative sign. Now it becomes positive. Now we're gonna um, factor out the R, right? So if we do that, then the right side becomes this. Therefore, the R will now we're gonna just move this. So it becomes the denominator, right? So that becomes denominator when this goes there. And then this is a num this becomes just numerator. Right? So this is how you calculate um, the 95% confidence interval um, for the R. And I'll actually leave it up to you to plug in the number. So basically what you have to do is to um, plug in the ZR lower and ZR uh, upper. It should be upper, sorry. Um, right, so upper. Uh, upper is the same anyway. Um, so you just basically plug in the number we obtained for ZR lower. So the lower was a negative uh, 1.6 and the lower, the lower was negative 1.6 and upper was negative 0.5. So all we have to do is just to plug in those ZR numbers to find the lower and upper boundary of the R. So this is how you calculate 95% confidence interval for R, and I want you to just um, you know uh, confirm and you know, what you get by plugging in those numbers. Okay. So here are the assumptions in calculating Pearson's R. So before you can calculate the um, the correlation coefficient because this is a parametric. Again, it has the um, kind of similar parametric assumptions about the data. So you need to check if your data are at least interval or um, uh, ratio level of a measurement because in calculating the R, um, you, the, the means are used, the means and standard deviations are used. So um, your data should be at least interval level of measurement. And also, um, the Pearson's R is based on the assumption that the data, um, the both of, you know, both data sets, right, um, uh, are coming from the normal distribution. And also, the measurement um, should be independent each other. Um, so it should not, so the measuring the, uh, for example, the measuring the non-exercise activity uh, should not affect uh, the measurement of the fat gain. So that's what it means. And also, um, the Pearson's R only assumes the linear relationship. Okay, so um, you would not use this um, to uh, model the, the other kind of relations, such as like a curvilinear quadratic relationship, you would not use Pearson's R. And these are the properties of Pearson's R. Um, as we already learned, uh, R ranges from negative, to, negative 1 to positive 1. So you cannot have R beyond these numbers. Um, and as it close to a one uh, that indicates this stronger relationship and if r close to zero then um, it indicates no relationship and again it only deals with straight line relationship 
And also, um, Pearson's R is symmetric um, between the two variables. What that means is that, you know, remember, one variable goes to X and the other goes to the Y. So it doesn't matter which one, which variable goes to the X and the Y. So we can, we can flip this. Even if we flip this, um, so we flip X to Y, Y to X, we still get the exactly same um, correlation coefficient. And finally, um, correlation coefficient is not affected by linear transformation of variables. And what that means is that adding, subtracting, and or multiplying a variable by a constant does not change the correlation of um, that variable with the other variable before and after uh, that transformation. So for example, the correlation between weight measured in kilogram and height measured in centimeter will be the same um, if we change the scale of those two variables to uh, pounds, so for weight and height in feet. So even if we change the scale or the unit of uh, those variables, as long as uh, the conversion or the transformation is linear, then it will not change um, the strength of the relationship between the two. So that will become the problem um, to use the Pearson's R as a um, way to uh, measure the agreement between the two methods measuring the same thing. And we're going to talk about this later um, when I explain the blend altman um, analysis. Right. Um, again, for the Pearson's R, we also have a non-parametric alternative um, in case the normality assumption is violated. And this non-parametric alternative um, correlation coefficient is known as Spearman's correlation coefficient. Um, so instead of R, it is a row statistics. So that is another Greek letter uh, to represent the Spearman's correlation coefficient. So again, this requires fewer parametric assumptions than Pearson's R. So it can be used in place of Pearson's R when some of the assumptions um, in Pearson's uh, breaks down. Um, so basically, you use this um, when uh, the normality assumption is violated. Uh, also, when your data set is ordinal uh, level of measurement. So this is uh, how to report the correlation coefficient. Um, so you have to indicate you know, which correlation coefficient you used. Uh, if it is a Pearson, uh, I mean Pearson's, then you use R. If it is a Spearman's, um, then you use Rho. There's another non-parametric way to calculate the correlation, uh, which is candles tau. Um, if you use the candles tau, then you use tau, the Greek letter tau. And usually no zero before the decimal points for the correlation coefficient, so because it ranges between negative one to one, so it never goes above one. So uh, typically you do not have to and um, put the zero in front of the decimal places. And as usual, uh, report exact p-value, so if you can, so if your statistical software allowed to um, you know, provide a very fine uh, precision, uh, then you can use the exact p-value wherever possible. If not, I mean, you know, in case the p-value is just too small, um, then you can just uh, uh, use some nominal kind of a um, level such as 0 0.01, 0 0.001, and so on.
And this is kind of a sample sentence, how to report the correlation statistics, so the negative relationship between the non-exercise um, activity change and fat gain was significant R, 14 degrees of freedom, and minus 2 equals negative 0.78 with the 95% confidence of all such and such. Um, and again, so these limits are actually in the real space, um, not in log space. And we'll see how we get that from Jamovi. And the p-value to observe uh, this correlation statistics or more extreme is this, which is less than 0.5, so we have significant correlation between these two variables, the non-exercise activity change and fat gain. So now let's just um, look at how to calculate the correlation coefficient and 95% percent confidence interval and p-value using Jamovi. Okay, so here is um, the data again. Um, so before we do anything, we need to do um, run descriptive statistics. And for statistics, let's just uh, get me started. And you need to check the normality, right? Um, plot. We can have box plot with the mean on it. Um, so you move both variables. And in fact, that's what we did last time to calculate the mean and standard deviation. So these three things, the number of data set, mean, standard deviation of each variable um, under study, is very basic descriptive statistics you typically um, include in your report, you know, um, paper, and so on. And so typically these are um, kind of a, a written in sentence, right? It is not just enough to show uh, the uh, readers um, in the table. And <clears throat> Our Shapiro work test for both variables actually um, turned out to be okay for the NML assumption because these two p values are greater than 0.05, so that means the normality of each variable is okay. Um, <clears throat> and these are the box plots, and it looks like they're quite symmetric around the center, uh, which is indirect evidence that they probably normally distribute it. And after that, you need to um, plot the scatter plot. So um, let me show you what I mean by they are symmetric. So we actually move the um, <coughs> non-exercise activity change to the X and fat gain to the Y, right? Uh, and look at this, and I'll just flip these two variables so that that can go to x-axis and non-exercise x have to go to the y-axis. And it doesn't help that the scatter plot should look exactly the same. Okay, I mean it is just flipped around this um, the line, but the actual correlation coefficient will be exactly the same. But it is recommended that um, you move the explanatory variable to the x-axis uh, whenever we know it, uh, whenever it is clear. And then the response variable goes to the y-axis. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so now you need this scatter plot. You need to report the scatter plot. And Sometimes you include the regression line to model uh, the relationship uh, we're not going to cover here. And to 
calculate the correlation coefficient, you need to go to regression correlation matrix. <clears throat> and see, there's a two different non-parametric alternative to Pearson's R. That but Pearson is default analysis. But in case the normality was violated, then you need to choose one of these. Um, <clears throat> so you move these variables to find um, all the statistics. So this is a correlation matrix table um, because uh, it is symmetric between the two variables. It has kind of a two by two table. But, you know, if you look at um, this non-exercise activity change and non-exercise non activity change, this is autocorrelation, right? So this is meaningless. It will give you the perfect correlation of the Pearson's R of one or in a negative one. So it is not showing you. And by the same token, you know, the fat gain versus fat gain. So this is just the, you know, autocorrelation. So you do not need that. So all you care is um, the correlation between fat gain and the non-exercise activity change. So you only need to look at this. So this is Pearson's R, negative 0.77856. So um, by two decimal places, you can see that this is negative 0.78. Um, so this is what we calculated, and p-value for this is this hole, right? And there is actually kind of a footnote here with the three stars, so it actually flags significant correlations for you. So whenever you see star, that means this correlation coefficient is statistically significant. And with only one star, um, that statistics is less than 0.05. And we have two stars, and it is less than 0.01, and three stars less than 0.01, and so on. So we do have actual p-value, so you can report the actual p-value uh, instead of using this kind of notations. Well, uh, people use um, the star system um, quite often, but and it is recommended that you report the exact p-value whenever you can. And these are the um, upper and lower limits of 95% confidence interval, and which was reported in your slide. And here is the N equals 16. So that is the number of pairs of um, the data set. Right, so as a summary, so here is um, sort of flow chart of correlation analysis. So um, like everything else, you need to explore the data first, have descriptives and some box plots. Um, in case you have quite large data set, you might want to have histograms too. And you also want to check the level of measurement. Um, and if the data set are that the data set is an interval or ratio level of measurement, then you can check the parametric assumption if both data sets are normally distributed. And if they are, then you can run the parametric Pearson's R. Um, but in case your data set um, is ordinal level of measurement, then you do not have to check the parametric assumption, you just go straight to run the experiments row. Or if the level of measurement is interval and ratio, but um, the data did not pass the assumption check. So for example, uh, one of uh, the variable is not normally distributed, then again, you need to choose to run experiments row. So this is kind of a, a basic steps um, to take in running the correlation analysis.